Harvard Church. Uh, I'm happy to be back. It's been a few months. And uh, just giving you a little glimpse as to what I shared with you guys the last time I was here. Remember, we shared something about Matthew 25. Um, just helping us to realize we don't have to be afraid of the second coming of Jesus, right? Uh, have enough oil, right? There's the three stories from Jesus. Hoard oil, develop talent, and care for the least of these. It's just a, it's just a basic little understanding of how Jesus has asked us to live our life on this planet while we wait for him to come back. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is... Um, a two-parter that we will complete next Saturday. It's called Not My Parents' Church. As you heard just a little while ago when I uh, did the welcome, I was inside a metal tube with my parents for two and a half weeks in something we called a vacation. It was fantastic. I, I want to clarify that in no way, shape, or form was this sermon inspired by being stuck with my parents for two and a half weeks. Okay. I had already written this for a young adult series uh, that I did in Canada earlier this year. And uh, I just invite you all to just pray uh, with and for me because the message today, I'm going to try to go through it pretty fast. Uh, I don't know if you've seen my social media, but I cover a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I go pretty fast. And the message for today... Um, can step on a few toes. Uh, or maybe I should have checked with Pastor Dave if, if I should have shared some of this, but it's all Bible, it's all Jesus, and hopefully it's a reflection of what has been my struggle as I look at our church and the different generations that have encompassed it, at least within my lifetime, and the different generations that have touched my life. Now, these are the seven generations of life today, and I put seven, quote unquote, because, man, if you meet a hundred-year-old today, it is a special thing. It is a special thing, and whether or not you can have a conversation about generations with that hundred-year-old is another thing altogether. But I do, I do have amazing memories of every single one of these generations that are listed here, and I'll go through them. Um, kind of in a in a way that kind of expands it and puts it into what we're talking about today. Because it's not that it's not my parents' church, and it's not. It's not my parents' church anymore. In fact, it's not going to be my parents' church um, either already in certain parts of the world or very, very soon because of some certain, certain biological realities. Now, at least here in the United States, it's called that first generation, the golden generation, or the greatest generation, as Tom Brokaw uh, coined it uh, a little while ago. Now, they were known for their courage, their sacrifice, and honor in the face of fear and overwhelming odds. There was no time to talk about the issues we deal with today because there were bigger fish to fry. The issues were there, but dealt with swiftly and severely because they had to survive, okay? How many of you guys know a few people from the Golden Generation and you have kind of an impressive memory about them? Uh, when I think about my grandparents who were from the Golden Generation, I'm like, and I don't know if I can say this phrase in church, but I'm like, holy cow, wow. The amount of work they put in, the things that my grandma with a fourth grade education was able to do in this life is amazing. Short, nothing short of amazing. Um, then you have the, what we like to call the silent generation, at least some people. And by the way, the ages that are listed there, are plus or minus a few years, I'm, I'm not going to be authoritative on the ranges here. But I am going to put in a little bit of my slants. The silent generation went through the Great Depression. Um, they had basically kind of the same formative uh, structure that the golden generation had. And they were loyal. They were persevering. They knew or they know, even if you find them today, how to do a lot with very little. And they had the same way of dealing with today's issues. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Right? 
Um, if you've met some of those people, probably one of those people that wash uh, Ziploc bags, you know, and reuse them. You know, they have the, the uh, cottage cheese, uh, and, and it kind of bleeds out to the future generation depending on what they went through. Now, just one, one more disclaimer. I am kind of focusing just kind of on the United States, but there is bleed through in most of Westernized society as we know today. Why am I talking about this? And uh, Pastor Dave did ask me to talk about this for a little bit, and I'll, I'll try to see if I can do that. I'm trying to go as fast as possible because maybe I, I bit off more than I could chew in terms of covering material. Now, on this stick right here, I have maybe three generations uh, as names. Each one of the names that are here, they're, they're cut into it, they're, uh, they are, what else, engraved, and then I burn them in. And each one of those names is a story. And each one of those stories has a lot to do with some of the things that I want to talk about today. Because the, the things they are dealing with, nobody else is dealing with. In the same way that the silent generation dealt with things that we are dealing with today. Okay? Now, each one of those stories is a story that was told to me, and I said, wherever I go, I will pray for you. I am praying for you. I'm going to remember your name. Your name goes with me wherever I go. So that's what I believe. Like if I say I'm going to pray for somebody, it's going to go with me wherever I go. It's going to be inconvenient. It's going to make me stand apart. I don't like a take on the Nazarite vow. The next generation is the boomers. And the boomers, um, I have two slides for them because this is a kind of a prototypical situation. They survived a ton of things and they wanted to really experience the wonderful things that they had, but to experience them. They had to be dedicated workers who valued the visibility and legacy of their work. Dad was gone a lot. Um, they had no time to deal with anything that would derail their work or the legacy of their work. And no matter what kind of work, the kids picked up on this, and uh, either they picked it up or they rejected it altogether. So you have a weird little start to some a different thing. And, all of a sudden, the nuclear family, um, the nuclear family started showing a little bit of its frayed edges, right? Because maybe because of overwork or maybe because of something else. Then you have Generation X. I love these people. I love these people. I don't know if I'm part of Generation X or if I'm part of Millennials. Because, uh, you know, it kind of bleeds over depends on who you ask. And Generation X are the children of those people, independent, well-educated individuals who had to make do with parents that were gone all the time. The individual was core, or is core, because the family started to be fragmented. And because of that, they became the tip of the spear in dealing with the issues of today, bearing the brunt of the traumatizing experiences of, one of when it was dealt with poorly. And finally, uh, this is what I actually consider myself. And I actually went to the beach with, where this movie was shot, and that's like, I took some pictures. Oh, that's so cool. That's amazing. They're called Xennials. They're not Gen X. They're not Millennials. They experience analog, and they experience digital at the same time. And if you identify with them, uh, wonderful, because they are informed dreamers who work as links between generations that are at odds with each other, experience everything analog and digital, and they have become and act as translators for generations who see, seem to speak different languages. And the nuclear family, for sure, at this point, started to become a rare commodity. Then we have our young adults of today. Did you know that millennials are now considered to be at least 40 years old? I don't know if you knew that. So when you say millennials, careful what you say. You're not talking about young children. You're talking about me. I have gray hairs. We have the awesome commodity of having gray hairs and pimples at the same time. That's fantastic. What a wonderful time to be alive. And the millennials a, are a collaborative and impact-oriented generation. These guys have dealt with the issues by advocating for everyone's right to identity, to be heard, to be seen. But it came with a high cost of relative truth. My truth is king, and I am the ultimate interpreter of that truth. Okay? So, once again... I am not putting down any particular version of the church or my parents' church. I'm just saying this is what's happening to the church, okay? And then 
we have the Xennials and Generation C. The same thing as Xennials, except Zs and Millennials. You have the Xennials who are the last risk takers. The risks are made for the sake of what they interpreted as being the most relevant thing for everyone. And they're curved by exposure to more people than any other generation, yet limited to how they interact despite having the most ability to interact. And finally, Gen Z, you've heard a ton of stuff about this, an optimistic yet risk-averse group. Gen Z is what my students are at Thunderbird right now. They want truth, while ironically not wanting to be labeled as a truth seeker. They have access to the most amount of information of any generation to date, yet lacking the basic moral and ethical tools to interpret that information. They know they have this problem, and they will not risk exposure to others who might be able to help, because that would be a risk, and it might mean exposure to people seeing who I really am or what I really lack. They consume vast amounts of media, yet it is generally morbidly afraid of creating the content of that media. It's so crazy. Like, I ask my students sometimes, oh, wouldn't you want to make a social media post about this? And they're like, oh, no. It has to be highly curated content. The nuclear family is generally a thing of the past for the majority of them. And then we have Generation Alpha, the final one. Okay? This is two million of these guys are born every week. <laughs> Kind of the Wild West. And we will see how they evolve and how cha they change our church as the first completely plugged in generation. So, how did and does each church generation tackle a verse like the following? Okay? Because last sermon I shared with you all. We talked about people being afraid of closed doors, and Jesus talked about, hey, let's cast them out where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, we know how the golden generation dealt with that. We know how the silent generation dealt with that. We know how the boomers dealt with that. We know how the Gen Xers ate the bullet for how they dealt with that and how they reacted and how they left the church by droves. We know how the millennials are dealing with it. So we have to ask ourselves, how would each one of these generations react to a verse like this? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So, my parents' church, and to a certain extent our church, still teach that we can only deal with some issues two ways. Acceptance or separation. And I've always been uncomfortable with that because I saw Jesus clearly as I was growing up, as I was understanding, as I was reading the Bible for myself, clearly using a third option. Now, before I talk about this, I want to be clear. Jesus never used any of the acronyms or the words we use today to refer to people's orientations and biological realities. And things were assumed and never defined. The closest he gets to that, you can find in Matthew 19, verses 1 through 15, where he talks about divorce, where he talks about adultery, and where he talks about eunuchs in verse 12, okay? And he doesn't even address orientation. Everything else comes from Moses and Paul. In verse 12, he just says, some chose to be that way, some were born that way, and some were made that way, All right? That's the closest Jesus gets. By the way, Auntie Ellen doesn't hit it directly either. Ellen White says zero about this. And some may say, but can't you come up with perspectives that they don't say? I find that to be incredibly dangerous. And every time I've seen it done, I cringe. One thing is clear. Both sides of the options that have been available up to this point if they are serious about change or growth in this area, have exposed us to incredibly dishonest approaches to what the Bible actually says. I want to repeat that again. Both sides, both options are being dishonest with Bible truth. And this is why I need you guys to pray for me. 
So, to start talking about this, we have to start from a place of common ground. Can we agree that Jesus is the manifestation of humanity that best represents God's standards of righteousness? Can we agree? Use your hands and say amen. Can we agree? Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ is it. Now, Jesus was the one who said this. Heaven and earth will disappear before the smallest letter disappears from the law. Not even the smallest stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is completed or fulfilled in some other versions. Here's what I tell you. You must be more righteous than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. If you are not, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that a, is that a harsh statement? <laughs> I think it is, right? And we've seen how different generations have dealt with this one, right? And different ways of being, of studying the Bible, different ways of living your life. Now, at the same time, isn't Jesus the person who attracted the most outcasts? Yes or no? Absolutely. Okay? Prostitutes, tax collectors, the oppressed, the oppressors, both sat at his feet. The thieves and the victims that the church, the people of his day, couldn't understand how someone on such intimate terms with God could be attractive to sinful people. And it wasn't just the religious people. The secular power of his time hated him because he was a huge problem to their claims over the lives of people. The way he was killed reflects the teamwork between religious and secular power. Sound familiar to the prophecies we've slung at people all these years throughout all of these generations that I've mentioned? Prophecies that had to do with the second coming. That combo killed him while a former prostitute washed his feet with her tears and a thief defended his reputation beside him on the cross. Now, not just because some influential boomers guided me there... <laughs> But I really think that John really understood the heart of Jesus' ministry in John 1.14, where he describes that they saw Jesus' ministry as full of what? Grace and truth. In John 4, he says to the, the, the Samaritan woman at the well, there's a day coming, and it's now here, where my worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. So you got grace and spirit, but truth remains. And that's what Jesus is looking for. That's what Jesus was looking for. Truth without grace is fundamentalism, and grace without truth is sentimentality. Do you understand what I'm telling you? I grew up in a truth church. Truth was king. Truth is paramount. And neither one of those is attractive without the other. And one without the other is not a reflection of Jesus. So when we are full of grace and truth like Jesus, I believe we can expect to provoke the same reaction that he did to attract the broken and push back the proud, to bring in the outcast and be looked at as bigots by secular and religious people and powers alike. So here are five ways to own being full of grace and truth if you read John 1 or spirit and truth if you read John 4. Number one, and we'll do 10 of them. Next Sabbath, we'll do the last five, okay? My church will own being friends of sinners. In Matthew 7, 1, Jesus says probably what is the most mispronounced, misquoted verse in the entire Bible, in my opinion. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. And I've probably, you've probably had an experience of somebody using this verse on you in some way, shape, or form. As culture around us tries to redefine truth, we're usually left with two options. Affirm them or exclude them. Have you ever heard the word affirmation? Yes. Have you ever heard of exclusion? Yes. I'm here to propose a third option. Okay? In Matthew 7, 1, Jesus gives a third option. Judge not so that you will not be judged. Who are you to say that this or that is wrong? Doesn't your Bible say to judge not? Was that what Jesus really meant here? Well, honestly, 
I don't think Jesus could have meant that because in John chapter 7, verse 24, he says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So what is he saying? You can't judge? Or is he saying to judge? Okay. We've got to really analyze this because when I teach Bible right next door, 20 feet away, I mean, however many feet away, I run into situations that boggle my mind and I see the permeating influence from each generation affecting every single one of these kids. And I ask them basic questions and the basic questions are based on what somebody else is telling them without double checking, without looking at the Bible. They have the most access to the Bible that has ever been given to humanity, right? Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, knowledge will increase. They will run to and fro. We're here. We're here. We're at that time. But knowledge increasing does not necessarily mean that wisdom has increased. So, he also, Jesus, spent a ton of time telling people that they were wrong. And sometimes we candy coat it in different ways. Just a few verses later, after judge not, Jesus says there's a wide gate and a narrow gate, and that most people are going through the wide gate to their destruction. Then if they want to be saved, they have to go, they got to go through the narrow gate. Is Jesus saying, hey, whatever works for you is fine? Is is that what he's saying? That's not what he's saying, sadly, or thankfully, depending who you ask. Later in Matthew, Jesus would tell a bunch of people, you are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. In fact, here's how Jesus would characterize his whole life. The world hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. And Jesus' followers did the same. Paul commanded Christians in the book of Ephesians to rebuke the works of darkness. John the Baptist confronted Herod and his wife on their policy of open marriage and lost his head for it. Jesus called him the greatest prophet to ever live. To, sorry, to be ever born. Sorry, that's what it said. So judging cannot mean that we don't tell our community when God's word says something is wrong. It means owning the loving of sinners has to do with what you do after you tell somebody the truth. That's what helps you differ from what we all confuse judging for. And what do we all confuse judging for? It's a word that starts with a C and ends with on damnation. <laughs> okay? You don't get to condemn. God is the one who separates the sheep from the goats. God is the one who separates the wheat from the tares. Do not ever confuse judging with condemnation. I can tell a person, hey, you really have a problem with heroin. Let me help you out. Is that the truth? Did I just judge them? 100% I just judged them. But what do I do? It's like, hey, you can come to my house. I'm going to set up aside a room for you, and you're going to go through withdrawals. I'm going to get you the, the, the help that you need, whether chemical, professional, or something else, to help you go through that moment. That is the proper use of judgment. That's how we become a friend of sinners. But heroin is just like one that not really stands out. But what about the other ones, right? What about that person that cannot stop gossiping in your social circle or in your Christian circle or in your church? Is that equally a bad thing? How do we share the truth with that person? Now, Jesus also says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order of the world that the world might be saved through him. Even the one who had the opportunity, the chance, the right to condemn, said, I didn't come to do that. Wow, isn't that crazy? Isn't that amazing? So even Jesus said a ton of judgmental things, and he didn't condemn. Why? Because not condemning does not mean not telling somebody the truth. It means not leaving them lying there after you tell the truth. With the acronym CROWD, this has happened a ton. They have been condemned by their church, even by their own Christian parents. And if we're being honest, we have to admit that this is not the way of Jesus. That is Satan's MO. Blame, condemn, and then remove access to the love of God. Have, have we owned our ability to, close, to be close to that community? Are we their friends? When we find somebody who's gay, 
How interested are we in them as a person beyond their sexuality? Do we see them as primarily gay and lesbian, or do we see them as people created by God, just like us, who happen to be gay and lesbian and have those desires? Do we talk about them about things other than their sexuality? I remember the first time, my first experience with that. I was, um, before children, I had a lot of problems with the cops because I like to drive fast. And uh, I had a really nice car. It was, I, I had lowered it. It was six-speed manual transmission, Civic SI. Uh, it, was, it was lowered to the ground. And I was, oh man, I was zoom around places. And I would end up at the courthouse quite often, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I would dress up to go because, you know, I had to make a good impression. I, I was in, in a kind of an, a, a heavily urban area in, in Milwaukee, and it was a crazy courtroom. There was hundreds of people there, and people would come in, and their cases would be read out loud, and when there's hundreds of people, and it's kind of an inner city crowd, it's like, you know, some lady had $2,300 in parking tickets, and everybody was like, oh, you know, <laughs> and I'm sitting back there, and I'm pointing, and I'm laughing, and Sitting next to me is a, is a, is a young man about my, my age, and um, he looks like he works out. And we begin talking. I find out he's an Olympian, right? Because uh, in Milwaukee, there's the Pettit Center, which is the speed skating. He was like a teammate to Anton Ono, so you guys remember that. Uh, I mean, he had the quads the size of my, smaller, my small back. I mean, back then, right now, I don't know. <laughs> And uh, we begin talking, and I'm well-dressed and everything, and, and I, in the middle of talking, I realize that the situation is, like, different than what I thought it was, and he ends up inviting me out for drinks to a bar, right? I, I'm wearing my wedding ring, and I'm like, hey, I'm married. He's like, ah, it doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> that kind of a thing, and I'm like, hey, I'm a pastor. It's like, hey, I would still like to hang out. We can talk about these things. You know, I come back home, and I, and I come to Tammy, and I just, I look at the ring because she wanted me to wear this ring, and I was like, it doesn't work, you know? <laughs> I end up playing in their, in their soccer team. They had to uh, find out, you know, it's like, what sports do you play? I love, I love playing soccer. And it was like an indoor soccer league. Um, man, these guys would train seven, eight hours a day and then go still play an hour and a half of soccer <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night. And our team was called the Pink Bunnies. I was the only straight guy in the team, right? And it was, it was an interesting experience because I had complete Bible studies with this individual but I knew I couldn't bring him to my church because I knew that my church was going to eat him alive. The world defines sexuality. Jesus did not. He sees us as his creation. He died for all of us. Every nation, all the corrupted heterosexuals, all the homosexual people, would they feel welcome in our home? Do we fight against abuse, injustice, and discrimination against that community? I'm not saying do we advocate for their right to sin. No, no. Do we advocate for their right to exist and be respected? When we love our position on sexual morality more than the people in that position, we have become known for our anger more for our anger than our compassion, by judgment rather than by friendship. This is not an invitation to go against what the Bible says or fail to share it. It just means that even when we disagree, when they disagree with us, we do not cut them off. We draw them close. We say, yes, this issue is important. I can't compromise on this, but I love you more than I love being right. And so... Even if you don't see things my way, I'm going to keep bringing you close and I'm going to remain committed to you in front of Jesus Christ and how he's helping me with this issue. How do we relate to them? Like Jesus, someone so compassionate with sinners that he gave up his own life to draw them close. Number two, my church will own up to ranking of sin. Talked about this in the teen Sabbath school today. We rank sin. Jeremiah tells us the human heart is deceitful above all things. When we rank, and in this case sexual sins, we show extreme ignorance about the teachings of Jesus. For with what judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? And look, there's a plank in your eye. 
Hypocrite! First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is confronting us for failing to grapple with our own sinfulness. Notice that Jesus assumes the log in our eyes. And this is what Jeremiah was talking about, right? Desperately wicked. Who can understand it? It's super sick. Our, our heart is sick. We are super good at hiding what we really want deep down. The beginning of sin is in every one of us. Those of us that recognize that speak humbly about ourselves and sin. What we have in common with other sinners is greater than any personal correctness we might have accomplished. We can't talk about the speck of sexual immorality in the neighbor's eye without seeing it through our own sexual log. Are you angry about sin? Not rhetorical. Are you angry about sin? Everybody's like, yes. Are you angry about sin? Has it damaged your life? Irreversibly. I'm glad you're angry about sin. But are we angry with other people's sins more than our own sin? That's what Jesus was trying to highlight in Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. When someone who has been saved from sexual sin is not in a different category from other sins. Remember the tax collector? Have pity on me. A sinner. And, and the guy's like, hey, thank you, Lord, that uh, I'm not like that person. And Jesus famously asked, who went home justified? Who went home feeling better? We pastors, especially, are guilty of talking about the speck in our neighbor's eye as if we're ignorant of our log. We don't actually say it. We kind of dance around it, but it's hard. And my dad has told me a whole ton of times, John, you cannot treat church like group therapy, right? My church will own up to ranking of sin. Jesus talks about this gut-level compassion in the parable of the unforgiving servant. You remember the guy? He, like, they forgave like $10 billion dollars. And then he finds his friend who has $10,000, and he's like, pow, kicks him, slaps him around, throws him in jail. And then there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, because how can you not understand the mercy that has been shown? The master forgives the servant for more amount than any of us could pay back in our lifetime. And this is the same chapter that specifies how you approach someone who sins against you. The same chapter Peter asked, how many times should I forgive somebody? But no. The servant who has forgiven a crazy amount can't forgive the guy that owes him a paycheck. If we are characterized by our disgust over somebody else's sin rather than by being overwhelmed by the forgiveness that God has given us, it means that we are desperately out of touch with the gospel. Do you understand what the gospel is? I hope you understand what the gospel is. Because I asked that question right across the street, and a lot of the kids do not understand what the gospel is. And it is a product of their parents' church. My church will own God's design for sexuality. They are very simple and super clear. Okay? Very simple and super clear. Some that want to justify the wrong way will claim that Jesus never talked about it. Well, there are two ways that Jesus could establish what's right and wrong in regard to sexuality. He could talk about every possible variation of the wrong and condemn them one by one, or he could put forward what is right. If I saw a lineup of six to nine-year-olds, uh, six to nine-year-old boys, I got my son right here in front of me, I could waste your time telling you which one isn't my son, or I can right away point out to the one that is actually him. And that's what Jesus did with this subject. Jesus chose to highlight the sanctity of sex within heterosexual marriage. If God meant for that sanctity to extend to other permutations, why would he not mention them? Does omission automatically mean inclusion? I think here we have a real opportunity to do something different from our parents. And that is that we have a real opportunity to put forward the most positive vision for Christian sexuality that has ever been shared. 
When we identify what is not right more than what is right, we lose what God gave us in Genesis 1 and 2. God said, let us make man in our image. God created man in his own image. Image is plural, okay? He created him in the image of God. He created them as male and female. And I've heard people talk about everybody's created in the image of God. I agree. But that image ends in something very specific. The first command in the Bible is about being fruitful and multiplying. It's, it's hard. It's hard when people start going and fishing for what God doesn't say or maybe presupposing something. And just if you continue reading, God gives us a very simple model that does not, does not include anything else. It's talking about something very, very specific. And this goes forward towards even our heterosexual brothers and sisters because... Every time Tammy and I do premarital counseling, chances are very high that we're going to end up having a conversation about, hey, have you checked out God's model for this whole intimacy thing? You should probably take a second look at that and maybe try to follow it because it is a life improvement plan, right? It's a three-step process. Leave your father and mother, become economically solvent, right? Be joined to your wife, which is not sex, right? Then the two will become one flesh. What is... What does culture do today? It's basically the other way around. But if you do it this way, you involve the families, you involve your parents' church, you involve everybody else, and everybody's together, and everybody's celebrating something that God designed that was beautiful, that was awesome. But if you keep reading in Genesis, God allowed polygamy, God allowed people who had surrogate uterus, uteruses and all these other things. And things got complicated. He still used it to fulfill all his prophecies. He still dealt with, like, dysfunctional families. Have you checked out Jacob's family? That was, mwah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> he dealt with it. He deals with it. He, he allows it to happen because that's what people choose to do. He still loves them. He still works with them. And I'm still talking about heterosexual people. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says that sex is a union between two independent beings, and the physical union of sex should be accompanied by oneness in every other area, emotional, spiritual, and financial. Anything less than a complete and total sexual unity that would take place in a covenant relationship would be subhuman. It's got a form of humanity, but not all of it. God designed that relationship, and he designed it that way. But if you enter it as a consumer relationship, a lot of things are going to go wrong really fast. And that's what's being pitched to your children every single day. To look at this relationship that God designed as something that is based on consumption. Paul points out that God created sex to achieve unity. And a unity, he says, between two genders that are other other gender, which shows God's love for things that are other and not just the same. The sex resembles our creator. It preached something. It demonstrated to us whether we are Christians or not. We must preach the positive and the beautiful dimensions of covenant love and sex. Can you imagine leaving your parents, becoming financially solvent, and then having a party that celebrates not only your purity, but the purity of your partner, and then you have the biggest party of your life to celebrate that, and after that, you celebrate basically incredible hormones incredible things that God has put into your pituitary gland and all these other things that make it a beautiful experience. Guilt-free, completely selfless love, and you celebrate that and you imprint on that, and that is how you experience that union for the rest of your life. I'm trying to share that with kids, but it's not, it's not making the leap because all they see is their parents and how they did it. I want to avoid either I want to avoid what they did, or I'm going to do it better, but then they end up taking the shortcuts anyway because they didn't get exposed to the truth in the first place. So, because of that, my church will own a message of repentance. Okay? Remember the greatest preacher, the greatest prophet to ever live according to Jesus? Remember him? His whole message was about what? 
a call to repentance. And this has not changed no matter what generation we are in. According to the Gospel of Mark, the first word out of Jesus' mouth as he announced his kingdom was repent. We know the Gospel of Mark, uh, we know we know the Gospel of Mark. What he's trying to do is trying to get the essence of Jesus' message, his ministry, down to, to what's most significant. And he says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee. He preached the good news. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. Now, I know the word repent in our day brings up images of people with sandwich boards and all kinds of crazy stuff, but repentance simply means that we acknowledge Jesus' lordship instead of our own. Every generation, not just ours, every generation establishes a standard for what is right and wrong. The worst condemnation given in the Bible is that a certain generation listened and did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right means that they were morally conscious according to themselves. There is a community today that is intensely moral in their own eyes, which means that they made their own sensibilities the standard. And coming to Jesus means to surrender of using our hearts and the beginning point for determining what is right and what is wrong and that we submit to his word as our beginning. Whether or not Jesus' lordship offends people, it varies, of course, from generation to generation. One generation, it was his teachings, it, it's, it's, it's his teachings outright. In another, it's what he said about nationalism and violence. In another, it's the equality and dignity of all people. In another, it might be about how God designed sexuality. Either way, and I could keep going, the Bible and Jesus, for that matter, are equal opportunity offenders. They will offend everybody. I cannot judge the hearts of those Christians who affirm to have a different kind of sexual lifestyle, but I can point out that the shift in their thinking on this appears to be part of a larger bending to the culture because it's just like that culture. And it doesn't matter what orientation there is. We find new ways to read the Bible and in turn justify what the culture sees as right in its own eyes. Even if that means turning their backs on what Christians have plainly taught and what believed, according to the Bible, for thousands of years. Some might say, thanks to whatever's left over from postmodernism, hey, what's your truth? Please respect my truth. Which was the favorite way of, to look at right and wrong that was introduced by the generation before mine, Generation X, and adopted almost exclusively by my generation. Because of that, in part, people today or the generations are somewhat saying, hey, we don't really know what the Bible says about this issue. We don't know the context of this type of life or what, how they lived their lives back then, we, we're just missing information. And then the problem becomes, if the Bible wasn't clear on this for thousands of years, then why have believers understood this to be clear? And supposedly for that long. It's more likely that one group doesn't want to be clear, or is it that everybody else was wrong? Or that the last 40 to 50 generations had it clear? If we say God has not been clear, there is also an equally high chance that God has been but we don't like what he said. The first question that Jesus puts forward in his preaching when it comes to who gets to make the rules will, is, will the law change? And he says clearly, what I'm about to tell you is true. Heaven and earth will disappear before the smallest letter disappears from the law. Not even the smallest stroke of a pen will disappear from the law until everything is completed. Do not break even one of the least of these important commandments. And do not teach others to break them. Yikes. If you do, you will be called the least important person in the kingdom of heaven. Instead, practice and teach these things and commands. Then you will be called important in the kingdom of heaven. Here's what I tell you. You must be more godly than the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. If you're not, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And finally, the last one. My church will own the truth the right way. We commonly hear the teaching that Homosexuality, for example, is wrong in the form of hate from both sides. And one might say, hey, until you change your view about God and the gay lifestyle, gay suicides are going to be on your head. And the other side might say, God hates sin. And if someone is doing something God calls an abomination, they deserve a version of that hate. Both are participating in 
condemning behavior. And as a person leading others to the door, which is Jesus, according to John 10, you must oppose both versions of those lies equally. Equally. If what the Bible says about homosexuality is true, how can it be loving not to lead to what the Bible says about it? That's a loving thing. And it's not just Leviticus 18, Romans 1, or 1 Corinthians 6, 9. For example, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, if you go and read it, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. There's a word there that's like, well, careful. It's not really talking about men with men. It's talking about um, men with men, but in a forceful way. Um, sorry, no, because if you go and you look at the words in the languages that match, which happen to be the Greek, I'm sorry, it's the same exact word that you find in Leviticus 18, in Romans 1. You cannot get around it. It's there. You can't get around it. Arsenokoitai, for example, which is supposedly the word for homosexual, it's not really the word for homosexual as we use it. It's mistranslated. Arseno means man, and koitai, same word where we get coitus. It's like man coitus, right? Man coitus. It's, it's, that's all you're going to get from that. And malakoi is supposedly effeminate. But keep reading the rest of the list. If you read Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, you're also going to find people that are kept out of the kingdom because they, they backmouth their parents. Because they insulted each other. Because they slandered other people. But no, we focus on one particular thing. We cannot rank sin. My church will own the truth the right way. The right way. So, some come and ask me, what about your kids? What if one or both of them exhibits that kind of behavior, nature, or choice? What would you do then? To me, the answer, to me, to me, and this is not, this is not a proud thing. This is where I am right now. I, I don't know what I'll do exactly, but right now, this is where I am. To me, the answer seems to be a simple one. I will introduce them to my practice when it comes to my sexual sin. I will bring them to the door of Jesus Christ. My sexual sin is not now, nor will it ever be worse or better than theirs. And this is what Jesus says about my sexual sin. And this is a statement to a male, a heterosexual male. But here's what I tell you. Don't even look at a woman with lust in your heart. Anyone who does has already committed adultery with her in his heart. How many men here have that on lockdown? You got that lockdown. You don't look ever in the wrong direction or think in the wrong way. So how can you ever point the finger in any other direction? I didn't ask to be that broken. Some would argue that I can't help how I sometimes feel about women other than my wife. I don't act on it, but Jesus still says it's a sin. Jesus took the, the, the commandment of adultery and raised it to what level? The heart, the mind. It's way higher than what it says on, the, on that seventh commandment. Some might argue that I was born this way. And if my children are congenitally predisposed to sin that way, it does not matter. They and I are born sinners, still need help from our Savior Jesus. And because of that, we would show up to the door broken and repentant, father and daughter, father and son, broken people in need of a Savior. Nobody is going to be left out of heaven for being LGBTQ. Why? Because we can't get there just by being heterosexual. That's the argument of false religion. You can do or be something that guarantees something that only God can give. Genesis 4, one brother brought to Jesus false religion. And Jesus said, no, I don't accept it. I don't want what you did. And one brother brought true religion. Jesus, I give you a recognition of what you're going to do for me. Thank you for what you will do for me. True religion, false religion. Do not overcomplicate what God has given to us and is very, very simple. The only thing 
that makes God's grace unavailable is the unpardonable sin. And what is that? Simple. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore, I say to you, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven them. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. What is blasphemy? Jesus was accused of it. It is someone who claims to put themselves in the place of God. And when we limit what God can and cannot forgive, we are toying with condemnation. The only thing that keeps us outside of God's grace is refusing it. God cannot forgive someone who refuses to let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. And according to Jesus, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment. What is the job of the Holy Spirit? To let you know, uh uh uh. <laughs> Probably not the way to go. And when you're like, uh uh uh, I'm gonna do whatever I want, you don't want forgiveness. But even after saying that, you say, I want forgiveness. And here's where it gets close to my heart. I asked my freshman class this year, how many of you are going to heaven? In all my classes, the only ones who raised their hands were non-SDA kids. Can you have certainty in the hope of Jesus Christ? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Titus chapter 3 verses 5 through 7 says, He saved us not because of works done by righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You are heirs of eternal life through Christ Jesus. And every single one of those kids looked at me and they didn't believe me when I read this to them. And I had to re-repeat it. You can have assurance of salvation. I wanted to cry. I wanted to cry. But I'm a man. (laughs) I cried later. It's not my parents' church, but it's also not my parents' church. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's the human heart, and the human heart yearns to save itself. You cannot save yourself. Jesus Christ saves you. Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. And if you think you're okay, you have no part of me. So if my kids go in a different direction from me, I will do what Jesus did. I will speak the truth and let the truth convict or be rejected. But the moment we push somebody away after speaking the truth, we have used the wrong version of judgment and completely failed to do what Jesus asked us to do. We have said as Jesus about the dudes that were standing on the walls of the city and failing to do their job protecting God's people. And as Jeremiah says, peace, peace. When there is no peace. Do not deceive people. We can use Ellen White for whatever we want. You can find whatever quote you want. But I just want us to really focus on what she says here. In 1864. If Christians are hated, the emphasis is mine. I changed it from singular to plural to apply to the church. That's it. Okay? If Christians are hated for the good they do and for following Jesus... They will be rewarded. But if they are hated because they don't make it a point to be loved, hated because they are bad-mannered and because they use the truth to argue with their neighbors, and because they've made the Sabbath as annoying as possible to them, they are a stumbling block to sinners, a disgrace to sacred tooth, and unless they repent, it would be better for them that a millstone was hung around their neck and be cast into the sea. The verse today comes from Jesus speaking to Martha. It's on your bulletin in the back. It's John chapter 11, verses 
25 through 26. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even if he dies. And those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? He's about to raise her brother from the dead. There's zero foundation for what was going to happen next. And he asked her, do you believe this? Didn't talk about her life. Didn't talk about her faith. Didn't talk about any of those other things. Do you believe? Do you believe? So I'm going to ask you the same thing. Do you believe? How many of you believe today? Help other people believe. That's your entire job. And you don't even need to speak a sermon, preach a sermon. You don't even need to give a Bible study. Hoard oil, develop talent, and help the least of these. That's what Jesus asked us to do. How many of us can do all three of those things? Every single one of us. My church will own being friends of sinners. My church will own up to ranking sin. My church will own God's designs for sexuality. My church will own a message of repentance. And my church will own the truth the right way. Spirit and truth. I long for a church that balances spirit and truth. Grace and truth. If you're really good at spirit... You really know how to love sinners, and I commend you for that. But chances are high you have problems with truth. If you're really good at truth, well, you're really good at truth. You can prove a lot of things. You know your way around the Bible, but I guarantee you, you have problems loving sinners. We need both. And that's the worshiper Jesus is looking for. That's the one that's coming. Join us next week for Not My Parents' Church, part two. We'll see the last five. If anybody wants these slides, anybody wants this information, I'm more than welcome to share it. Please excuse my transparency, but I don't mess with the gospel. And we live in a time where choices are at premium. Choices are already being made for every single one of the generations that are around. And I'm done messing around. I want the choice to be clear. I want the choice to be Jesus. Who here would like to bow our heads in prayer and choose Jesus with me today? Dear Jesus, I know it's not my parents' church, but you know what? I loved my parents' church. (laughs) Despite the things and how it scarred me, there's still some type of attachment. And I think the mistake that I've made, Heavenly Father, and I ask forgiveness for this, is calling it my parents' church. It's my church too. The church hasn't changed. You want to marry the whole church. We go to Revelation and there's seven types of churches. They all do different things and there's a part of Jesus in every single one of them. Heavenly Father, help us come together cross-generationally to lift each other up. This is why we cannot neglect the assembly of believers. This is why we get together to discuss these things and to lift each other up and bring others to the foot of your throne. And as we do that today, Heavenly Father, forgive the ways that we've blasphemed the Holy Spirit in our lives. Help us to move forward and to become real partners with Christ and the Holy Spirit in somebody else's life. Not just today, not just tomorrow, not just next week, but for the rest of our lives until we see you coming through the clouds. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.